Everybody is born with a little something extra, and sometimes they just have to find it. A little something extra is that superpower that every single one of us has inside that motivates us and drives our passion and, and makes us do the things that we do. We're all on the same team. Let's think about how we can make that team as inclusive as we can. For those of you listening to our podcast right now, you can also check out our video podcast at a little something extra podcast.org. So, so, so right here, our a little something extra is with me, the DG. And this is Gianni. Thank you. And the fuck girl Gianni. Yeah. Thank you. And I want to say welcome to John O'Hurley, my co-host. Woo! Oh, well, that was very nicely done. Thank you. I welcome. feel very welcome. Well, mm-hmm. that voice, like, I, I want to do an intro, <laughs> but that voice on its own is its own intro. Your voice <laughs> is so legendary. I don't think there's a person in this world. Like, my kids, when we mm-hmm. were, our, you know, we watched you. Now my kids watch you. Every generation has now watched John O'Hurley through Jay Peterman, but you are so much more than just that character. I uh, I try to keep uh, I, I try to spin a lot of hats. Let me put it that way. Keep a lot of things going. But I'll let you in on a little secret, actually. <clears throat> you like secrets. When I was 16 years old. My voice was the last one to change oh in no. high school. <laughs> I had a I had a little pipsqueak voice like this, up there really? like that, till I was like 16 years old, and then one day I woke up, and it had dropped. <laughs> However, I was at the time I was doing. Uh, we had a very interesting, uh, varied uh, theater program in our high school, so we were doing a children's play called. A li- or excuse me, Sinbad the Sailor. And I was playing his 10-year-old assistant. Oh. Why was I 10 years old? Be- I, because I had the little voice with me. <laughs> well, I walk, in, I walk into one performance one day, and all of a sudden the voice is down here, and, like and, I, and I'm six feet tall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, and so the gig was up. <laughs> yeah, like we're going to have to make a change from this guy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He can no longer play the 10-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> but it was um, <clears throat> back then. Um, voices were very important on the radio, mm-hmm. and in the early days, you've heard of the Beatles. No, you haven't heard of the <laughs> Beatles. <laughs> wow! Well, wow, well, well, by we the time I leave this weekend, <laughs> you're going to be singing Beatles songs all over. Yeah. The world. <laughs> well, you got some work to do there, Gigi. So the Beatles. Like the Beatles Gigi. were probably, I, I think, arguably the most famous rock and roll group in the history of totally. music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But back in that time, when I was a youngster in, in high school, um, the radio stations controlled all of the music. It wasn't the record companies. It wasn't the, um, um, the producers. No. It was the DJs at the record, because you had to plead with them to play your records. Yeah. And you would have mm-hmm. to go to the station, oh, yeah. and you'd have to do a anymore. concert in the area. And so for me, it was always learning these, and all of these DJs had these interesting voices. Every one of them, they all had a voice that sounded like this. <laughs> you know, it's like, and it was like, you know, you act today and you can have every album ever recorded, you know, <laughs> sitting on your lawn by tomorrow afternoon. Um, they always had these very interesting voices. So as my voice was changing, I tried to learn about the musicality of the human voice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that's where I got, I think that's where I developed my sense of vocal range and, and interest. And, and then, uh, then, of course, I studied uh, opera for uh, many wow. years. Did you? And, um, and uh, so, you know, I, I began to learn that the voice is actually an instrument. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did, you ever think, did you ever think about that? The voice is an instrument, actually. Yeah. Now, if yeah. I want to, if and everything has to deal mm-hmm. with tone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Tone is D. That's mm-hmm. tone. Now, if I want to extend the tone, D. Now I'm singing, but if I just mm-hmm. go D, now I'm talking. So it's the difference between singing and talking is just how you sustain tone. Mm-hmm. That's, That's a, a, a yeah. Can you do a, a high pitch? 
Can I do a high pitch? <laughs> oh, he's 15. You want to put your fingers in your ears? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I uh, Can I go up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, that's that really good. good. <laughs> yeah. Way better than me. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's Way better than you. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, you're still learning too. Yeah, I know. I'm still learning. Listen, I yeah. listen. I. You never really learn your. You've never fully learned your voice. You're always constantly trying to improve it, because it's an instrument, and mm-hmm. you're and you're playing it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're always working on that, aren't you? Yes. My 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 instrument. Is my voice. Your instrument so. is your voice. Well, yeah. I understand. No, I understand <laughs> that you have actually sung the national anthem. I did. Now, I want you to know that that <laughs> is <laughs> the most difficult song for any amateur singer <laughs> to accomplish. It is. It's not written really well. <laughs> now, it's a beautiful song. It has beautiful words, but for a singer, the vowels are just <laughs> the worst. You know, for the land of the free. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> that, that E is a tough <laughs> thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> Very tough note, yep. um, and uh, just the way that the way the song is is con- the 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 song is actually written as one long running sentence. Mm-hmm. It's if you that look at it, it's just yeah. an yeah. ongoing just sentence, yeah. and most people don't Minutes. realize it, and that's why they always end up screwing up the lyrics because they <laughs> think <laughs> it's a different. You're starting a different sentence. You're not. It's a run-on sentence, run the whole on. thing. Yeah. No. I've, been, mm-hmm. I've been practicing the song with my, with my voice coach. Oh, have you? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh. For years, yeah. For you, yeah, it's yes. huge because you have to be able to strengthen your body in yeah. order to do it, right? Well, that's I tell you, it's a wonderful thing to learn because core. yeah, Sorry, yeah. You, when you use your you core, it. you use your core to sing. It's almost like the singing is like stretching a rubber band. The mm-hmm. higher you go, the longer you're stretching that rubber band mm-hmm. and letting it back. Okay. And then you're going, the higher you go, the longer you're stretching that rubber band, mm-hmm. and then you let it go. <coughs> so it's a little bit like using your using your core, but using it as kind of a rubbery substance so that it stretches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 I was telling him that. I was explaining to him because he was asking about people with Down syndrome and what that extra chromosome <laughs> does. And I was talking about the low muscle tone yeah. and that how you- But you're jealous. I, I am jealous because I, I only have a, a chromosome that, a diamond <laughs> chromosome that I wear <laughs> and she has it in her whole body. So she tells me that I'm just jealous that she gets it everywhere <laughs> and I don't. And I kind of agree with her. And I have low muscle tone because I'm lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't like to use those muscles. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so building yourself up, building up those muscles, that's mm. why you can sing it, right? Right. And you love that note. I do. She always gets that finger up in the air oh, as she's that's, singing it. That's, <laughs> what, that's the money note. That yeah. is the money note. That's what everybody comes to it? listen for. What are yep. they going to do when they get to the land of the, the land of the free and the yep. home of the brave? And then either they come at you with booze or they come with you with huge cheers after you do it. Right, Cheech? Right. And you never faced that. You didn't have to deal with the booze. No. Everyone loved hearing you sing. <laughs> yeah. I, I read somewhere that that you, with the Jay Peterman thing, when you started with Seinfeld, mm-hmm. that you weren't even gonna go to that interview. No. So that was a true story. I don't, I don't know where I read it, and, it, and I remember hearing I originally it. Had, I, I originally said, no, I'll, I'll tell you the story of how um, Peterman uh, ended up on Seinfeld. I had a, um, a sitcom, a comedy, that was on ABC for, um, and we only lasted about a year. It was called A Whole New Ball Game. And it was a very, very mm-hmm. funny show with a very talented cast. But okay. true to form, you, you get, uh, you know, the, the networks are cruel mm-hmm. that yep. way. They'll, they'll cancel the show on you. Yep. So they called Wednesday morning, said, don't bother coming to work. Bad we day. Pulled the plank, we pulled the plug on the show. Well, I went out to dinner that night with my manager, crying in my beer, trying to take the cancellation as personally as I possibly <laughs> could. <laughs> And I got a, we got a call from Larry David's office while we, my, we were having dinner. And his office said, uh, we heard John's show got canceled. We have a guest star role tomorrow. And we're just starting a brand new episode. There's a funny character. Um, John could really chew the wallpaper with it. And uh, it's me. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, d- so he said, uh, do you want to come over and do it? And I said, tell him no. 
I mm. said, tell them no. And this was, and Seinfeld at the time was Seinfeld, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was It was huge. the number one show yeah. on TV. Yeah. Yeah. And you were. <laughs> but I still, you know, I said I was still licking my wounds yeah. over the cancellation. Mm. So at, anyway, um, my manager never called and said no. So the following morning, he called me and said, mm-hmm. it's 1030. Go over there. They're waiting for you. So I said, you. He accepted it for you. Little. Ooh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how, and, and so that's how it started. Had he, um, had he made that call, I would have uh, never been on Seinfeld, and I would have probably not, si- not been sitting here with you, <laughs> and um, I would have disappeared into a cultural vacuum. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But was I, it Jay but Peterman it all crazy. along? Was, it, was that for that role? Because it feels like that role was just made for you, that you were, I mean. It was an interesting, you know, I, uh, I when the Jay Peterman, the premise of the show, the premise of the character is that he runs a clothing company, but it's not just a clothing company, it's a one-of-a-kind romantic wear, and the way he advertises it with no, no photos, everything is a pastel drawing yeah. with a long Hemingway-style adventure series. <laughs> about climbing K2 in your <laughs> Oxford button-down. <laughs> and, uh, you know, fortunately, I was, we- you know, uh, no matter what it was, I heard the bulls off in the distance. So <laughs> fortunately, I had my Italian capto <laughs> Oxford. You know, sophisticated yeah. yet different without making a huge fuss about it. You know. And um, it's always this kind of Hemingway style. Yeah. So... They didn't know what they wanted when they brought the character onto the show. They just thought it'd be kind of fun if Elaine met him in the rain and uh, <laughs> and um, see what happened. Yeah. And um, so we end up, uh, they hand me the catalog and they say, we just want him to sound the way, they, the, way the, the, the story is written in the catalog, as though this is just tripping off of his tongue, yeah. and this is the way he talks. So I looked at it, and I said, well, it sounds a little bit to me like a 40s radio drama <laughs> combined with a bit of a bad Charles Kuralt, <laughs> <coughs> for, for those that know who he is. Uh, but anyway, so it just became this kind, he just became a raving lunatic. Yeah. Which is awesome. As though he was just <laughs> speaking this kind of episodes. absurd poetry all the time uh-huh. and uh, and so that's how the character developed and and he got crazier and crazier as time went on and uh, over the yes. five years that I was there he became a raving lunatic yeah, yeah. yeah. it was and then just you know leaving going to minimum going off to yeah, going yeah. off to Burma to yeah, well, you may know it as Burma but it will always be me and Mark to me yeah. <laughs> so you're, in the, you're in the phone booth in the jungle that's, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, who's, yes, yeah, so when I was telling Elaine that I could no longer run the company, she said, well, who's going to run it? And I said, well, why not you? And she says, why me? And I said, why indeed? <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite is the quote that you say when you get back and you walk in there and you just go, all right, Elaine, a job done. Oh, yeah, she said, how about, yeah, how about my stock options? I think not. <laughs> <laughs> Elaine, congratulations on a job done. <laughs> the best. Yeah. And what I love about it's, that, because I, I was just, I, I've been a huge fan of Seinfeld since I was, oddly enough, like six years old, seven years old. I just, I, it was huge for me. Like, I had the wow. whole DVD set, like, every time, really? that, at a really young age. It was kind of weird, because you guys never really showed it to me. I just It's, it's a silly show. It. And it, 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 it's and, hilarious. But it's a day, silly show, it. but it's a very smart show. It is. Well, it's so I'm surprised well that at six you picked it up. Yeah, well, yeah. the best is because, I mean, I was young. For some reason, I really liked it then. But then, the older I got, the more I've started enjoying it, because I love the way that Larry David writes. Mm-hmm. And just every the whole writing crew for that mm-hmm. show, because it's so... It's a circle. You mean you start at one point and it sets the stage for what the entire episode is going to be, and it comes and there'll be three subplots, so three subplots yeah. that yes. all inter- mm-hmm. interweave. Yeah, and, and, and he even does it now to this day with Curb. It's it's still very similar. Yeah. So, I, so and there I are no, and, and also what's interesting about Seinfeld, if you go back over and listen to it carefully, yeah. there are no, um, there are no jokes in it. No. And yeah. if you play it for the jokes, it's not funny. Mm-mm. And this took me a while to understand. Well, yeah, I was ah. assuming because you read the script. the yeah. scenes are funny, but they're only funny if you play them as a serious drama. Yeah, so you have to true. play everything at mm-hmm. the top of the scale, mm-hmm. almost over the top, yeah. for, the, for the scene to actually be funny. Work. Everybody yeah, has so to be living at the state of dis- desperation. Yeah. You know, like George is... <laughs> 
eternally mediocre, <laughs> swinging on the middle <laughs> rung of the ladder of life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and that's what you have to appreciate. And that's what you yeah. have to do. Yeah. He has to be passionately mediocre, mm-hmm. <laughs> not just yes. mediocre. Passionately, passionately mediocre, yeah. and he knows it too. Yeah, and that's that's the and, key. Uh, self awareness. Otherwise, the show isn't funny. Mm-hmm. But that's what made Seinfeld so unique was that. It yeah. was about see. It was not about jokes. It mm-hmm. wasn't like Golden Girls or mm-hmm. or Mash yeah. or Cheers or where you set the joke up and you deliver the punchline. Set the joke mm-hmm. up, deliver the. It wasn't about that at all. Yeah. There was no punchline to deliver. It was just about the passion of the human experience in New York City, in an mm-hmm. elevator that uh, had twelve people that only fit ten. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. always that sense of the compression of <laughs> of the experience of mm-hmm. living in New York. Did you but live in New York at the time? Uh, no, <clears throat> no, I was living in L.A. We shot it. We yeah, shot it in L.A. Was it was all LA. shot in L.A. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> was uh, do you have like a favorite episode in the show or a moment for well, you? Well, I maybe have. For <clears throat> I have many, um, uh, many favorite episodes, but the one that always comes back to me though was the. Uh, was the Frogger episode where George had the record um, exactly. on the Frogger machine, the pinball yeah. machine? He had the highest score ever done, and so it was sitting there at the pizza parlor, and he happens to stumble upon it, and he realizes that they're closing the pizza parlor because it wasn't doing any business anymore, and the Frogger mm-hmm. score was still on there, and he turns to Jerry and he says, "You don't understand. I'm never going to have children." <laughs> This, this, sco- is my this score is all I have in my life that I've ever achieved. So he has to find a way to move the Frogger machine across the street to, an, to another vendor. And uh, Anyway, I just thought it yeah. was one of the best episodes written, executed. And then that also included the, the theft of the antique piece of um, wedding cake from the Duke oh. and Duchess of Windsor, <laughs> which was one of and where Elaine wolfs down this priceless piece of wedding cake. That's for like thirty thousand yeah. dollars, and um, <laughs> and replaces it with a two dollars slice of Entenmann's. <laughs> and at the end of and at the yeah. end of the show, I finally discover what she has done via my security cameras. Uh-huh. And I call her in. She sits down in front of me, and I said, Elaine, do you have any idea what happens to a? <laughs> Butter base frosting after six decades and a poorly ventilated British basement. I think what you're about to go through will be punishment <laughs> enough. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah. It seriously is. Yeah. The writing, and then also I love that episode too, where they when George is crossing the street with the Frogger machine. Oh, it was just they brilliant. take an aerial shot. Up aerial shot. Like I say, it Frogger, just, so it's I mean, it was Frogger just with the, right. the conception <laughs> of that <laughs> show. It was yes. just so wonderfully executed. Can, yeah. yeah. How you can be able to come up with that. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I do want to go back because I also want to talk about other stuff outside of Seinfeld. But one of the things that I really did not realize in just looking up you and just doing a little research back on the John Peterman company mm-hmm. is the fact that it existed prior to Seinfeld. And that most people didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. fact that it's it seems like Seinfeld decided with you to take a satirical approach as to what John was actually doing with that company. It was absolutely. It was uh, kind of a tongue. It was kind of a parody of a parody. A, a, yeah. A bit. But here's the funny thing, and this is the way Seinfeld operated. They never told John Peterman they were using his character. Oh, oh they no didn't. Way. Oh, I thought. He oh was no, fully they away. just did it, and they asked for permission later. Oh. That Sounds was, like someone that else. Was, I know. That was the way that they worked, and so yeah. it was. Um, that might be how I roll. Uh huh. That's <laughs> exactly right. It's a lot easier to get permission yeah, later than it is for yes. the permission up front. And um, so oh. yeah. So uh, he find he he was on a plane. He comes back into the office the following morning, and they say you were on Seinfeld last night. Oh he goes, goodness. no, I was on a plane. They said, no, you were on Seinfeld, the character. Yeah. Well, this brought all sorts of uh, all of a sudden the calls to the lawyers and all. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the in, in in the standoff that ensued, they realized they were going to get a lot farther with um, the uh, the publicity than they oh, ever would. Yeah. And in truth, he, he got practically almost a billion dollars worth of free publicity oh. over the f- five years that I was uh, there on the show. Absolutely. And, um, yeah. so, and the, the PS to the story was he went bankrupt the year after Seinfeld ended. Wow. And he called me and he said, I've got the intellectual property rights back for the company. What do you say we put the company back together under our parallel strengths? Um, <laughs> In that he's he's Jay Peterman, 
but yeah. not really. Right. <laughs> You're right. I'm You're Peter Jay Peterman. Peterman. Yeah. <clears throat> and he had he had singularly lost his identity. It was the greatest act of identity theft wow. ever. Ever. Yeah. And I am, and I did not give it back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so we put the company back together again, and uh, I owned the company with him. You still for, do? I still do. Yeah. Wow. Some 27 years later. Yeah. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Isn't that fun? Yes. Yeah. So fun. And did you guys ever? I like the role so much, I bought the company. Right. There, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's John and Jacobo doing, <laughs> doing it together. <laughs> and Bos- then Bosco. Yeah. Bosco. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I just think it's a phenomenal story. The fact that it came full circle like that, and the fact that now you're it is a really it. it's really, it really cool. Is. Yeah, really it's peculiar. a really it's just a really cool business story too. Yeah. And the fact that mm. you did create yep. so much free publicity for him, and him being able to then just and and the uh, you know and the catalog and and the company is as it was still these uh, I love the website these Hemingway so. style mm-hmm. stories about uh, this kind of romantic wear or adventure wear mm-hmm. but this kind of and then in there he would also have antiques that were one of a kind he had a he had a, a half million dollar Duesenberg that he was selling <laughs> right yeah. there in the catalog it's crazy and imagine calling the operator up and say I'll take the d- I'll take I'll, the uh, I'll take the here's my credit card number for the doozy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Any any uh, thoughts about bringing back the Mongolian horsehair vest? Uh, no, <laughs> no. But you know, we did because we got so you know for years we got so much um, mm-hmm. about the um, urban sombrero. Oh, yeah. of course. Oh. And Elaine's he was greatest con- he was contribution. adamant that he wasn't going to ever touch that. Yeah. Because as much as he appreciated the publicity, he secretly kind of had a little bit of animosity towards the idea yeah. that that he was a, that, that the, all of the work he had done had now become a parody on yeah. television you know yeah, no, and you think about sense. it it's Seriously. kind of yeah it's like you know somebody can go in steal brand. your name yeah. really is. steal your identity and you've lost it for the rest yeah. of your life and yeah. that's it i mean he he will never be john he'll never be j peter no if he can, he signs anything. They go no. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we know Jay Peterman. Come on yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, so, but yeah, it's uh, it is a it's uh, as Marshall McLuhan once said: one day the message and the medium will become indistinguishable, and I'm the living example. There you wow. go. Yeah. I know. And my last question. This is kind of transitioning away from Seinfeld, though. Um, I think. I mean, you've done a ton of voice acting work mm-hmm. and extremely accomplished in that which makes total sense i have a lot of um yeah, quite a few and did that come <clears throat> after seinfeld because people just heard that voice on peterman is like well is i i did a, i did a little of it before Seinfeld. yeah mm-hmm. because i was doing a lot of sitcoms back mm-hmm. then and so all of the casting directors from the from the animated studios knew who you were and, and yeah but so i did a little bit of it but it it uh, i mean things like um becoming um uh, for many years, I've been uh, King Neptune on SpongeBob. I Bob. love that yes. one. Yeah. I know, <laughs> and uh, and I continue and actually continue to do that because uh, Patrick is now the spinoff of SpongeBob. Oh, and, I didn't and, know that. Uh, so so, um, so Neptune Neptune continues. He oh, that's awesome! Yeah. Yeah. And and here's that's your uh, here's your trivia question: Who plays my wife, the Queen, oh. on SpongeBob? I don't know. Victoria Beckham. Really? Oh, no Spice. way. Oh, yep. You want to say it? You knew? Yeah. Um, Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, you don't my god. I even goodness. know who Victoria Beckham is. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's interesting. And that is that happened more recently? I haven't I haven't seen the updated Oh, before. no. I want to say that was probably I've been doing it for probably 10, 15 years, so. Okay. But somewhere halfway through it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Gotcha. I think they 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 got her to become my wife. That's an awesome. That's, that's yeah. A, isn't that funny? Awesome coaster funny. to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'll take Amazing. her. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I, I don't want to be pulling away from G, because I know G just some questions, too. Uh, what about or me? Or you. Sorry. Miss, Sorry. Anybody, anybody I'm so curious others? about what, so out of all the, you could do your questions, too. We're just going to fight over you, John. We're just going to fight. Now you're in the middle of the Gianni cat fight. You get to host a show with we him, all want to, so. yeah, you get to host a show with him Give tomorrow. Give us a moment. I want my moment. What, out of all five, the different things that you've done, okay, thank you. Five minutes I get with you. <laughs> Out of all of the different things that you have done throughout your whole career, what what is your favorite? What is your is it? You know, I uh, I honestly love um, Broadway. Really? Theater. That's what Tish was telling me. She, I uh, I've done two thousand performances as Billy <laughs> Flynn in the musical Chicago. 
uh, about a thousand as King uh, as uh, um, King Arthur in uh, Spamalot. Oh my gosh! And uh, among uh, 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 oh, yeah. dozens of other shows that I did, the Pirates of Penzance and a lot of stuff on Broadway. Wow. But I, I just I, I love I love the idea of having a live audience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because there's an sense. energy in the room and there's a wonderful relationship that's set up very interestingly at eight o'clock as they begin to take their seats in the chair and you come on stage and you realize that you need them as much as they need you and so it's this wonderful semblance of beginning to lay out a story from the point of innocence and building upon the story building upon the story until 10 30 at night when they're all on their feet screaming and cheering and um, you awesome. knew you were going to get there. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just, it's a fun thing to do every night. And wow. then also at 1030 at night, you leave the theater and you go out and say hello to people that are hanging by the stage door. And by yeah. 1045, you're sitting having a very, very nice dinner at <laughs> one of your favorite restaurants. And it's just, it's a wonderful lifestyle. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I love it. I love it. It's incredible. Uh, mm-hmm. So you're traveling all the time still. I live in an airplane. I wrote a uh, one-man musical. I saw that. That uh, is called A Man with Standards. Uh, the standards being the music mm. of the 50s and the 60s and mm. the great American songbook and uh, Frank Sinatra, Mancini, Boone River, you know, the, the like. And I use that music to underscore the stories of my life at that period. So oh. it's, uh, it's a funny, it's a very funny and, and uh, a, a very uh, pointed uh, mm-hmm. It's it's I I call it music laughter and only one tear, love only it, one tear. love it. Yeah, and so it's a wonder. So I do that all around the country, and uh, oh okay, that's wow. been a lot of fun. I've been doing it for about seven years now. Yeah, wow, incredible. Yeah. That's a lot. Two hundred mm-hmm. t- two hundred days out of the year traveling. That's a lot. I do. When he got here, I was so we're, we're first of all so grateful that you chose us as a charity. You chose Gigi to help give a voice and to everybody with Down syndrome. And and what I loved is is I didn't know you from anybody. The way that I had your phone number and you and I just talked on the phone and mm. you were just you were just so gracious. Mm-hmm. You listened to me, you understood what I was asking you, mm-hmm. you came forward and said you would help us. Mm-hmm. And then when I heard you on the radio on on the ads, you were so sincere. And like you, you studied us. That means so much to us. You, you weren't just going to walk in the well, room tomorrow a, night. Well, this has been a, an enormous learning experience for me. Um, you know, a month ago, I, I had no idea what you were doing, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I've learned an enormous, enormous amount. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it really is. Th- there's a profoundness to the whole circumstance of Down syndrome. Um, and and in, in in the many ways that it is debilitating, it's also empowering, mm-hmm. and the fact that it 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 blesses so many people in a larger circle. It's Absolutely. not just the person affected by Down syndrome; it's the five or ten people that are surrounding them that are constant constant caregivers and um, and coaches and yeah. um, and support groups and uh, it. Um, it, you know, it really kind of underscores one of the great things about the the human family, that it's not what happens to us in life, it's it's what we do about it. Absolutely. You know, and, um, and this is a one, I mean, this organization is an extraordinary example that, uh, that you have led but from yeah. your, from literally having to embrace this from day one. But uh, from t- but taking it to a, a national level is an extraordinary, an absolutely extraordinary uh, achievement, and I hope you're well, proud. I hope you're I, proud of yourself because you damn well should be. Oh, brother, thank you. It, I, it's mm. not me alone. It's all of us together. Course, it's people like you who step up and give us a voice because mm. we need that. I mm. mean, our kids need it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I look at, at at everything that we've done for 21 years now. We've been serving individuals with Down syndrome with free programs, one-on-one tutoring, literacy, math, career programs, fitness programs, whatever it is, mm-hmm. yet we still haven't been able to give them the voice that they deserve. You know, we, so mm-hmm. having you and that voice that you're so <laughs> famous for and just your, like, I, I guess it's just so gracious, the fact that I knew that you didn't just get off the plane to come here and do what you had to do tomorrow night to help us. You studied us. 
you learned about us. And that means everything. And I, I can't thank you enough for that because mm -hmm. you, you're you not just giving a voice to them. You're giving your voice. You're giving your love. Mm -hmm. And we feel it. And I felt it from the first time I talked to you. So mm -hmm. I just want to thank you mm -hmm. so much for doing that. And, and I know we still have questions, but I just, the main thing to me was just the person that you are, you know, the person that we always looked up to that, like that's Jay Peterman and, and you're that, you are so much bigger and so much better than I ever would have imagined. And I thank you so much for okay. being here, giving them a voice and mm -hmm. taking your time to learn about mm -hmm. Gigi's Playhouse, to learn about individuals with Down syndrome. You didn't just walk in here and then stand up tomorrow because you can, you can do this for anything. You've got that voice where you can just stand up and you've got that personality. You took the time to get to know us and, and that means everything to me, to my family, to Gigi's Playhouse, to all of our locations. You are, um, you're a blessing. So well, thank you for that. You've added so much to my appreciation for yet another crevice in the human experience. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, you can have your time now. She I know she's been not happy with me. She was writing that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> All right, now you be gentle with yeah. it. <laughs> Don't ask me no no gotcha questions. <laughs> Is there anything I should know about a co-host before we go up there? Anything about you being her co-host before we go up there? Well, I know that I will be in the presence of greatness and that I will be living mm -hmm. in your shadow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right, go ahead. And I have to be very, very careful because I know at any one moment I'll get a backhand across the face <laughs> if, I, if I if I try to if I try to stand in front. <laughs> That's very true. What is your favorite part about being a TV? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. At the age of three, my earliest those were my earliest memories. Now, some people don't wow. remember things until much later, but I remembered things very early. And when I was three, I had large people standing over me. And they all were asking the same question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Mm. What do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> I do. It's a big ah, question for a three-year-old. So right? <laughs> big question for a three-year-old. And I thought to myself, well, maybe they were just asking me because they were looking for a better idea for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> like he seems pretty wise. But, yeah. <laughs> with a sense of disgust that only a three-year-old can muster. Uh, and this was a long time ago when the TVs were not in color, they were in black and white. Oh. I would point to the black and white TV in the corner of the living room and I would say, well, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. No and it's way. not that I wanted to be an actor. That's it was that I was an actor. I knew, that and every time I watched television, when I was three, four, five, ten years old, didn't matter. Every time I watched television, I knew I was supposed to be there. Whoa. So for me, it was always about finding a way to connect the dots. Now, let me add another part of the story. Nobody had a deeper sense of stage fright than I did. You know what stage fright is? Oh, my goodness. It's like, you know you're supposed to be on stage, but you're f afraid to go out there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody had, I knew I was an actor. I knew I was a great actor. But boy, I was afraid to do it. Wow. And every, I, it was every bone in my body. I wouldn't mm -hmm. sleep the night before a show. I couldn't sleep the whole night. I was so nervous. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I learned, and I said to myself, and this, kid, this went on into my professional career when I was in New York, too. Um, I finally decided that I said, I cannot continue in this as my career if I continue with this fear. Mm -hmm. I said, it, it makes no sense, there's no sense to it, and there's certainly nothing productive coming from it. So I sat myself down on an opening night on Broadway for a, a play called Mass Appeal. And I said, I'm gonna do something that I've never done before. I'm gonna throw the show away tonight. I'm gonna forget about everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna walk out st on stage tonight and my first objective will be to have fun. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm gonna try that and that's all I'm gonna think about. I'm gonna have fun. 
Well, I have to tell you mm-hmm. that that was an absolute life-changing experience. It worked? For me. Wow. Because I learned that it was my, if I want to change my thoughts and I wanted to change my feelings, I had to change the way that I thought. Wow. Mm-hmm. So if I wanted to feel differently, I had to think differently. Wow. And so that's how I became a much more confident actor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Makes I sense. lost. And now I've evolved a little bit. And so before I go on stage every night, and even before we did this interview, mm-hmm. I say one prayer. And it's a short prayer. Mm-hmm. I say, God, let me be surprised. Wow. And that's all I say. Mm-hmm. And you know why I say that? Mm-hmm. Because it calms me down. Okay. And then it also means I'm looking for my surprise. So I have no wow. reason to be nervous. I'm just out there looking for a surprise. Yeah. Now, I like that. on Broadway, it drives the cast nuts. <laughs> 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 Because I'm looking right in their eyes, and they better deliver an honest performance <laughs> to me. That there's no phoning in because I won't answer them. Right. Oh. <laughs> I'll literally just sit there and go, mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Is that all you got? Would you like to get deliver that line again? <laughs> <laughs> and this time, could you possibly be more interesting? <laughs> I'm sure they love working with you. <laughs> Bring a surprise. Oh, that is um, fantastic. That's great advice, though. I, I that always say, that God, let me be surprised. That's it. Wow. Yeah. And it... Um, it, uh, it guides everything I do on stage. Absolutely. But for my, own, my, my whole life, I knew what I wanted to do at the age of wow. three, and it was just about connecting the dots. That's amazing. Yeah. I like Let Me Be Surprised, because I, I always, I, I literally, I, I don't know why God has put me in this place to be her voice, to be the voice of, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it's, it's overwhelming. It's, and it, the anxiety I get before I have to do all these things is um, crazy still. That's why I was waiting to hear how you did it. And mm-hmm. I do, I, all I ask is that God, God give me that voice. Give, mm-hmm. Let me be that person. Let me be who I'm supposed to. Give me the words to make people understand mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and make them see. Yep. And uh, yeah, the prayers sometimes help, but I like the idea of just, what, what did you say the first thing? Make me laugh. Wait, what did you say you were going to, just go have fun. Just go, oh, yeah, I walk on stage now. It's just go have fun. Yep. Okay. To, yeah. Go have and fun. That so that's what we're going to do tomorrow night. We're going to have oh, fun. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. Fun. So much fun. If you had one message to the world, what would it be? One message to the one world. One message to the world. To the world. Maybe a co-host. What would it be? <laughs> <laughs> you, you always need a co-host. <laughs> you know, here's what and it my, always has to be Gigi. You know, here's, <laughs> we'll be in here's, my, show. here's, my, here's my one message to the world. Is that I wish the world could learn how to stop worrying about the future mm. and stop living in the past and instead learn to live only in the present moment. Well, I like that. Well, well, that's a good message. It know. is. It is. Yeah. That's what you, I, I do you like that message. That's Gigi's where I need to go. very good at doing Gigi's that, too. <laughs> I because always that's, say. <laughs> that's, the only, yeah. that's, that's the only place. That's the only place you'll ever meet God. That's yeah. the only place he knows how to hang. He only hangs around in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Yes. He doesn't he hang does around in the future. Past. He doesn't hang around in the past. Yes. Those are our things. Those are the yeah. things that we've created. Wow. But he only lives in mm. the present moment. So if you want to ever have a chat with God, make mm. sure you're in the present moment. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. Because I say that about you, that you yeah. live in the present, right? That's why every time we walk out of a hotel room, I always go the wrong way. Because, and you're always like, you are the wrong way. I always go the wrong way. And Because I'm always either <laughs> thinking about where I have to be, mm-hmm. the future, mm-hmm. or thinking about what I didn't do mm-hmm. that I had to get done yesterday. Mm-hmm. And I, so I'm just, uh, where am I going? And then this one's like, Jeez. this way. Like she's just this calm that tells me. This way. And I listen because she's always right. Mm-hmm. Aren't you? She's your <laughs> shepherd know. in the moment. She's my shepherd all the time. Yep. She's my gift from God. It is. Yep. That's a great one. I was in Cleveland from my high school. Mm-hmm. I, I was a waitress. You were a waitress? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. And what, what did she work for? Betty, what, what? Betty Lou. Betty Lou. Mm-hmm. That's a perfect way. Every, every waitress <laughs> should be named Betty Lou. <laughs> I that love that. perfect it's, waitress name. Um, it's the place called the Pump Boys Dinettes. Pump Boys and Dinettes. Pump, pump, pump Boys and Dinettes. Yes. I know it was actually it was actually a Broadway show mm-hmm. for a long yeah. time. Very, very popular mm-hmm. Broadway show. 
And yeah, what did you work for? In uh, that? <clears throat> what did Betty oh. look? Betty, look, what did she work for? <sighs> you gotta be ready my for name it. Was, my, my, my name was Betty Lou, and I worked for Tips. There it is. <laughs> she worked. <laughs> And, so that's never made, and those tips have made its way into the podcast now, too. <laughs> yes. Right? Every time we do a podcast, Gigi has at the end of the episode, she talks about her tips. tips. That's better. Thanks. When you say, yeah, Franco didn't, he didn't sing it. Again. I don't have the Can we try? Can you do it again? Like you. No, I'm okay. I don't <laughs> think they need to hear my you know, high pitched voice. It's the last thing they need. Do you want to do your tips while we're here? I did say tips. Tips! Woo! She wanted to Very sing nice. for you. She was going to get a song heard, in there for you, John. I, I, I heard a little vibrato sneaking oh, in Oh, how about that? Hmm. Sorry. Uh, Imagine oh, that. Oh, that's, oh, no, that's good. <laughs> Very few people can put vibrato in their voice. She finds a way to put it in every hip-hop song. Whatever song <laughs> you got, singing. she can add a little vibrato to it. Yes. <laughs> well, it's hard. It's hard, but, but you're famous. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> These are my tips for public speaking. For public speaking. Oh, okay. Let me hear these. I could use these. Mommy. Sorry. Always practice before you speak. True. Mm -hmm. Make sure to take deep breaths. Mommy. Speak slowly. It's easy to talk to, to talk too fast. Focus on the moment. Try to be confident. You do great. Remember to smile. <laughs> Those are perfect. Those are great. Yeah. Every one of those are 100% valid. Anything mm -hmm. to add to public speaking? Well, the easiest way to remember how to speak publicly <laughs> is to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, <laughs> and then tell them okay. what you told them. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Every good speech has those three elements. Yep. I think I got that. <laughs> yeah. And those are DG's John Hurley tips. Oh, those are Gigi and John O'Hurley tips. You know what we didn't? I know I, I saw that on you, and I know you wanted to talk about the dogs. What got you into the? Obviously, you're a dog lover. You're a animal lover. Mm -hmm. How did that whole? How did that gig start? Uh, the so head of, awesome. The head. This is now twenty. Well, we're going on year twenty three wow. on the dog show. Yeah. Wow, it's insane. Um, the um, uh, twenty three years ago, the head of NBC Sports took the, uh, mm -hmm. the movie Best in Show, it's which was a parody. It's such a good movie. It's so funny. It so. is a hysterical <laughs> show. And it's a parody on the mm -hmm. Westminster Dog Show. And um, so he took it home over the weekend and watched it and watched it twice. He liked it so much. And he came into the morning meeting on Monday at NBC Sports, and he said, I know what we're going to do with that two-hour slice after – uh, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and before football, we're going to run. A, we're going to do a dog show. Well, they about laughed him out of the office. <laughs> but by the end of the day, the end of Monday, he had Purina as a sponsor. <laughs> he had licensed one of the shows from the Kennel Club of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. um, and he had put together the bones of the the national dog show. Mm -hmm. And then on Tuesday morning. He called me out in Los Angeles, and I picked up the phone, and I said, hello. And he said, woof, woof. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started. I had no idea what I was doing. He had doing you at anyway. woof. He had me at woof. Um, <laughs> but I've always, you know, I mean, in, in truth, I've always had a dog in my life. Yeah. Was, uh, and now we, we actually just lost uh, one dog uh, last week. So oh. we had we had three, uh, and now we're, we're back down to two. Um, I already knew that. Yeah. I know. But that's, you know, we don't have them forever. We only yeah. have them for a little time. But they do wonderful things. And, mm -hmm. and the wonderful things about dogs is that they do wonderful mm -hmm. things, yet they know not what they do. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know? They, it's um, true. We, we, we but, had a dog. No, we're not. Yeah. Now we don't. Now we don't. Now we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Now we don't. Yeah, he died a couple months ago. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. It's yeah. It happens. Tough to let them. Know. It's tough to let them go, but yes. you, mm -hmm. you give them away to. They still miss him. Yeah. 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 Well, but th isn't that now? <laughs> is it? Isn't it like a top show? Like, isn't it one of the most viewed shows? It is shows? next to the. It is next to the Super Bowl. It is the most watched show on television. <laughs> it's it is. So uh, awesome. We get we get an audience of about uh, thirty two million. That watched the show. Yeah, yeah, I, think I think we got 33 million this year. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, I mean, the Super Bowl did 100 million or something like that. Yeah. But, but there's, I mean, there's nothing that uh, com compares with that. But, but um, 
We got 33 million. Wow. Which at a time when all mm-hmm. of television ratings are going, going way yes, down. Yes, right. We are going up. That's awesome. And there's something very, ma- mm-hmm. I think it's something very magical about the, the power of what dogs communicate totally. to us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just that calming. Yeah. I know. Like, and it's yeah. also, but it's also, you know, the great family day of the year on mm-hmm. Thanksgiving Day. So it's really, it's the perfect piece of television programming. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Can I tell them that we have a Super Bowl magazine? Sure, you can tell them. Oh, oh yeah. We have a Super Bowl magazine. We had an ad. Uh, in the, in uh, and we had an program. ad in the Super Bowl magazine. Yeah. Did you? Did. Yes, we're well, very well, excited well, about that. You. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. So we are definitely mm-hmm. trying to get Branch the out. message of acceptance for all out to populations beyond. And to the world. To the world. Yeah. Absolutely, to the world. Yeah. So the first people that saw our ad mm-hmm. were the people who were at the Super Bowl. And now anybody who gets that program book from the Super Bowl will be able to see mm-hmm. our ad. And it's really about global acceptance. So it's about Generation G, which is what we're going to be celebrating tomorrow night. Yep. Generation G is our message for global acceptance. Be generous, mm-hmm. be kind, be accepting. Mm-hmm. I was about to say it. Okay. But, you, no, go ahead. You no, can no, say it. No, it's fine. It's What's fine. Generation G? Be accepting, be generous, be kind. Woo! Kill it, girl. <laughs> and people can take the acceptance pledge at IAcceptYou.org. And try a heart in your hands. And you could draw a heart, heart in your hand. hand and put it on social media. Aww. And say, I accept you as you are. Right? And put a G right. in the middle of it. Yes. And that's yes. Generation G. Taking your commitment. So that's, we, what we, a wonderful, wonderful message. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to be, yeah, tomorrow night we're going to be <laughs> talking about it. We're going to be awarding some Generation G yep. hero awards mm-hmm. to some NFL players who wore the My Cause, My Cleats <laughs> for GGs. So they wore Gigi's cleats. And only, really, only for me. Only for you. They did it just for you. I think they might have done it for some other kids, people with Down syndrome too, but mostly you. Yes. <laughs> yes, but like maybe their kids. <laughs> That would yeah, like maybe they're all kids. Word for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's okay. They they had you in mind too. Both. Right, that's for sure. And both. definitely oh, on their feet. Both, both. So yeah, both. Mm-hmm. Yes, both. Both for them and one for me. Yes, yes. Because you know, at the end of the day, big. it always has <laughs> to be even slightly <laughs> about Gigi. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Okay? They're famous too. That's why. That's yeah. true. She's that's now coined herself the Gigi. So yes. Oh, you're yeah. a br- you're a brand. Yes. Yep. Oh yeah. The Gigi way. The the. The DJ way. Yes. It's Gigi's brand. That yep. She, she started that when she was about 14. Herself. Now she's also the Chicago It girl. Yep. So, also oh. self coined. Yeah. Yep. Again, self coined. Yeah. <laughs> John, just like you, if she says it enough times, you were three years old well, three and you years professed old. that you were an actor and you breathed it. it into existence and look at you today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Doing it all. Uh, Trying to. Yeah. yeah. Well, do you want to ask our main question oh, about the show? Yeah. Oh, one that we ask everyone. Oh, you want to do it? No. Nope. She really, yeah, wow, nice. Gigi's like, she's loving her John O'Hara. I can't wait for tomorrow night because Sorry. the fact that she's loving being yeah, with him, gonna it's going to be gonna, great. It's going to be good. You can say it. I can right. say it? Yes. Okay, so should. our show <laughs> is called A Little Something Extra. It's all about <laughs> what is that superpower? What is that something extra, your passion that drives you every single day? What do you feel? What is your something extra? Oh, well, <clears throat> she's going to get it at the end. What yeah. drives me every day is this. <laughs> I believe that we have two choices in life, mm-hmm. and that's it. We can have an ordinary life, or we can have an extraordinary life. Mm-hmm. And everything is based on the power of our choices, not the mm-hmm. size of our wallet, mm-hmm. not the experiences that we have in our life. It is Everything is all about the choices that we make. Mm-hmm. And we make a choice every moment of our life, every present moment we make a choice to have an extraordinary life or an ordinary life. And every time that we devalue what we imagine, every time we l- worry about the future or the past, or every time we have lost our ability to, to love, we take another step towards an ordinary life. Mm. I like it. Yes, I'm learning. This is going to, tomorrow night, I'm going to be so zen and chill. <laughs> he has shown me to, He's it's like, did God in- send him here <laughs> to talk to me, to calm me down? Did you guys say <laughs> she needs a little help? Because <clears throat> everything you've said, I've listened or to. And me. And, well, you calm me too, but 
I love everything you said, and I so appreciate your words, not just because it's helped me, but because I think it'll help everybody else who's listening and for giving, obviously, a voice to our kids. Well, so important. You. We're so thank grateful you. to have you here. It's very important that I absorb this message or I wouldn't be here. Yes. Well, thank you for that. My boyfriend's coming tomorrow. Oh, boy. Too. So she had to get, she's like, oh, I can tell that the show is wrapping so up, I'm, so we need to. Not only am I listen. living in your shadow. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Not only am I living in your shadow, but I have competition. <laughs> <laughs> she had well, to get I'm that in there. I'm happy you got that in there, G. She, she, she sensed it. She's like, I could tell that. She can tell to, wrap up was coming. It. She's like, I got to get Lucas in. Just I so you know, I have a boyfriend. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I want to. And then, yes, okay. Lucas can meet him tomorrow as well. Yes. Yes. To see his, to see his, his girlfriend, the host. Yes. Yes, so. Lucas is definitely mm -hmm. your ultimate husband. <laughs> that is very true. Yes, he's going to be very proud of you tomorrow. He will. Yes. He's very excited. So, are you uh, getting all dressed up? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because otherwise, and I mean, yeah. I'm, I brought a tuxedo. I <laughs> I only wear a tuxedo for the national dog show. That's it. Nope. Oh. He's gonna match with me. Oh. So, so. see. Uh -huh. So now, Sorry. Uh -huh. yeah. Sorry. Now you guys could look very dapper. On Everybody's stage together. Yes. Oh. So did you hear that? And we're gonna do it. And we're gonna do it. anything past her boyfriend. Okay. No. <laughs> She's such a. And we're gonna do it as audience too. Okay, so. here we go. That's all, all she's right. been waiting now for. Now we're just, Gigi's just going to talk about her boyfriend. Be, yeah. So I think it's time to Now it's the Gigi and Lucas story out. Yes. <laughs> they have had some incredible viral videos going on about their little love story that they have. So Yes, we've just turned this into a pay-per-view event. <laughs> 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 all right, well, John, thank you so Great much. to be here. For being yeah. on a little mm -hmm. something extra. You and bet. we look forward to having you tomorrow night. And mm -hmm. our my co host. Your co host at our <laughs> Gigi's Mouse Gala. I have a voice gala. Sorry, You're I'm going to get in trouble it. if I don't brand properly. <laughs> yeah, you should. Sorry. I think I'd have it by now, but see? Yeah, see 21 yeah. years, it still learning. Because I'm just going to have fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to be Zen. I'm, I'm going to be in the present. And no drinking? Drinking. And you're going oh, to say. And you're gonna be looking for surprises. And I'm going to be <laughs> looking for surprises. Uh huh. And you're going to drinking, too. Yep, I get to have a drink tomorrow. But I'm, after I so, speak, I'm not going to drink until I'm done. I know. And, and then. It, and then we drink like Shriners. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is born with a little something extra, and sometimes they just have to find it. A little something extra is that superpower that every single one of us has inside that motivates us and drives our passion and, and makes us do the things that we do. We're all on the same team. Let's think about how we can make that team as inclusive as we can. For those of you listening to our podcast right now, you can also check out our video podcast at a little something extra podcast.org.